What's going on, everybody? And a happy Friday to you here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm Jason Mackey alongside Andrew Destin for another episode of Pitching In. We're brought to you, as always, by the North Shore Tavern. If you love baseball, you will love the North Shore Tavern. I promise you the interior is wall-to-wall -wall pirates. There are appetizers, entrees, cocktails, and, of course, steak and seafood on a sizzling lava stone. Open every day. The North Shore Tavern across from PNC Park is Pittsburgh's home for steak on a, steak on a stone. Andrew's in Toronto covering the NHL All-Star Game. What's up, man? How are you? Sneaking in a little baseball time is what I'm doing, man. I'm uh... <laughs> Enjoy, enjoying Toronto. Um, got in here yesterday and uh, was here back in December when the Pens played here. So enjoying the city. It's a great one. I know you're a fan of Toronto and all these I Canadian am. cities too. So um, where, where are you staying? Uh, Courtyard by Marriott downtown. So y not, Young not the Rogers Center anymore. Young Street? Yeah, you know it. Okay. Young Street, but spelled weird. Yeah. It looks like Yalange. Yeah, Yowl yeah Yowl they're Yowl really going to mess with me here. I'm like, is this Canadian? <laughs> Canadian is a Brit I don't know, man. Whatever. <laughs> So one of my favorite hotels on the NHL circuit was the Delta, and it's really hard to get a rate there. It's right by Scotiabank, Scotiabank Place? Yeah, uh, Arena, Scotiabank Arena. Scotiabank Arena, yeah. um, which is awesome. Like, if you've never been, you know, as a fan, as a hockey fan, if, I'm not talking to you, Andrew, but, like, if you've never been to Toronto, it's so good, man. It's such a great time, um, but the Delta is right there. I got upgraded. I think I've told you this story before. I got upgraded to this, like, super high suite that was all, all windows, oh. like, all around. Um, and you're like, you know, taking a shower and just looking out. I'm on like the 30th floor. It was just immaculate. I, I, I love that place. I miss going to Toronto. Have you checked out the Hall of Fame? I have. Yeah. Back here in December, I did. So that a boy. The, the museum buff in me is going to explore around a little bit tomorrow, though. Might go to the art museum here. Oh, we'll see. I love I it. I can't help myself. I can't help it. <laughs> now, you've been to Cooperstown. I like have. A, yeah. Like a good baseball fan. I'm a bad baseball fan and went for the first time. What did you think? Um, yeah, so I've been twice and a little aside is that my sister went to college really close to there, actually, like no more than an hour's drive. She went to Hamilton College in Utica. So I will okay. never forget when I was 14, we made a detour. It was like her graduation weekend. And me and my dad were like, hey, great grad dinner. Um, museums open for like four <laughs> hours. Okay, if we leave. <laughs> you, di you ditched your sister on her graduation night? It, it was the day before. I'll, I'll forget. Okay. All right. Yes. So we'd like done the whole activities the day prior, did the dinner, got the dinner it. Was like really early, and it was like one of those nights when the museum was open till like nine p.m. And we were like, we're okay. not missing anything at this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> I <I'll> thought, <laughs> dude, I thought it was like right after she graduated. <laughs> Instead of a dinner, you and your dad are like, "Hey, museum's open. Like, congratulations. I know you worked really hard, but we gotta go." <laughs> Yeah, that would be a treat. And if she's watching this, I know hopefully she confirms my story. Maybe I have the details wrong, but um, all told, awesome museum. I've been to three of the four Hall of Fames. I haven't done basketball. Um, what do you like the best? Uh, definitely baseball, dude. It's not close. I, I love it. What was your thought? I mean, you, you had a hell of an experience. But... Well, yeah. And, <laughs> and I swear we have actual baseball talk. Um, I wanted to get into the Pirates position by position, see what is better, what is not. Uh, I want to talk a little Willie Peralta. Um, and maybe even a, an important number or two to watch for the Pirates. So I promise you we have actual stuff on this baseball podcast, but I couldn't let it go without talking about the Hall of Fame, man. Holy, yeah, yes, I had an experience. I had I joked with the Hall of Fame people. I said, I can't come back here like a normal person. Like you guys just gave me a private <laughs> tour with a senior curator leading our group around. Um, and, and you're with Jim Leland the entire time, who is telling incredible stories at every stop. Um you can't beat that, right? Like, no, I, I would have probably spent like the tour is about two and a half hours. And obviously I had to stay on the tour and I couldn't, you know, venture off. But I mean, I could spend days there. I think what probably the same for any baseball fan. Um, but it was just wild to hear Leland telling stories about you go over to the Stan Musial stuff and he's telling about Stan Musial playing the harmonica. Um, you know, like the, the thing I led with about the, his time with the Orioles and Earl Weaver, and you should probably get another job and hearing him talk about like Miguel Cabrera and David Ortiz. And there was just on and on, man. It was so good. Um, I, I loved it. I would, and I've never been to that part of New York at all. Um, I don't think I've ever been to Syracuse or Rochester, but you know, Cooperstown, central New York, it was my first time going through there. Um, or like, you know, staying around there, I should say. Um, I just loved it, dude. I can't wait to go back, take Abby. I can't wait to hopefully go back this summer for Leland's thing. Um, whenever he's inducted, I want to stay in Cooperstown. We went to, we got lunch at some place called Mel's. I think it was, and it was 
like a couple blocks down from the hall, but just incredible, incredible spot. Um, can't recommend it enough. Not that I'm recommending it to you, you know, uh, but anybody out there, geez. It was. Yeah. Only recommendation is you hit on it. Got to get up there in the summer. That's a special, special right. time. Yeah. And like leave days for it. Like don't just leave one day. In my opinion, don't just leave one day and think you're going to see everything. Like you, you didn't. And I, I had to get back for work. I wish I could have stayed up there a long, long time, man. It just, yeah. I, I don't have any issue with it being the winter. Dude, it was so pretty up there. Um, I, yeah, I'm sure in the summer it's even better. But, yeah, I, I, I thought a lot about, like, okay, how soon can I get back up here? That was first thought. So, all right. Let's get into some pirate stuff, though. Uh, we could go on and on about the Hall of Fame. But um, the Aroldis Chapman signing got me thinking in this direction. And we'll start with the bullpen. If you look at the pirates and what they're supposed to be, and Chapman talked about this on a Zoom call yesterday saying he thinks the pirates are this young hungry team he's a competitive guy that's why he wants to do it he's very excited about the opportunity blah 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 that Aroldis chapman is signing here that the pirates are doing what they're doing i mean they think they're going to win more than 76 games i know that there will be dissenting views on social media and among fans and i certainly understand and respect them but um if you look at what they think they think they're going to be better perhaps over 500, win total mid-80s, be competitive. I happen to think they can. I don't think their offseason's done. But I wanted to go piece by piece, starting with Chapman and that bullpen, Andrew. Are they better than they were last year? And if so, why? They're absolutely better. And yeah. the, This is the easy one, by the way. Right. I was going to say, this is definitely the easy one because Chapman makes them better. But I also want to just take it a step back further, just you know, the 10,000-foot view is look at where the bullpen was going into 2023 even. Right. Like this was a completely different. <laughs> Good point. I mean, yeah, it's a completely revamped group. I mean, there's no more, you know, no offense to any of these individuals, but, you know, no Will Crow, no Chase DeYoung, no Dwayne Underwood Jr. These were guys that were key bullpen cogs for a couple of years. And now it's been totally revamped. Um, and it's not just, OK, the Eraldis Chapman signing is nice. And having Colin Holderman after he was traded for in 2022, I believe, um, you know, getting him you know, settled into that 80th, eighth inning role and healthy was excellent. But you know, the guys they got off the scrap heap, like Orion Barucki, he really solidified himself as a nice left-handed arm. Um, Jose Hernandez is a left-handed arm that you look at and say, okay, this is a guy who settled in after being a Rule 5 guy. Um, you know, Carmen Majinski was a rookie last year. Um, we're going to see a lot more of Carmen. I just look at this bullpen and say, it's not even just the oldest this Chapman signing. I just think it's a deeper group that the second half of the season in particular, we saw it kind of start to shape into maybe what we're going to see at the start of 2024. But I think across the board. It's a better bullpen. And um, I don't think it would be a stretch to say that it might be the best bullpen in the NL Central. I don't know that that's too much of a stretch. No, I, I don't think I would disagree with you there. Um, and I think that's what the Pirates are going for, mm. right? Like if you're not going to spend the money on the free agent market starting pitching wise, at least you're spending it on relief, I guess. But they're shortening games for sure. And I think the interesting part to me, Andrew, is the trickle down too. Um, like, you know, Bednar is going to be good. You know, Chapman's going to be good. Those are going to be your two primary back end guys, right? Like I also really like Colin Holderman and Carmen Majinski. As you said, I think they're going to play important roles. That's only halfway there. And I think what's cool about this is they're then freeing themselves up to Ryan Barucki. You can use earlier in the game and he was a great matchup lefty. He was great. If you wanted to give him a whole inning, um, Shoot, he was great if you want to have him open and then you're looking for spots, you know, if you want him to get through some like left on left stuff and then you bring in Quinn Priester for innings two through five, hope to get a lead and then go six, seven, eight, nine. I'm good with that. And I think the Pirates are set up to do that a lot. And so basically, and I've written this, I just think they're they're able to be more liberal. Um, yeah, that's that's said appropriately with Correct. their best arms. Um, and I, I just I think that's going to be a matchup advantage to the pirates. And I also look at, you know, Bailey falter, Luis Ortiz, you might be making things easier for them. If those guys are pitching as a piggyback, pitching the fifth, the sixth, something like that, much friendlier innings, and you can sort of pick your spots with their matchups, you're deploying those guys in a much better spot. So to me, I mean, that's the trickle down that Chapman has created. No, it's an expensive trickle down, but it's the one area that we can definitively say is better. Yeah. And I think with that last note of it being an expensive trickle down, at the very least, this is a, you know, if worse comes to shove, right? It, you know, worst case, 
Push Did you say if down. worst comes to shove? Push comes to shove. Worst, <laughs> worst case scenario. Yeah, that was bad. That was really bad. That was awesome. Um, that's going to go in the book. Um, but going to go in Gene Collier's mixologist <laughs> nominated. If the worst comes to shove. Yeah, that's up there, man. That's up there. Um, but with Chapman, it's like the worst case scenario is, okay, you gave this guy, you know, X amount of money, right? You gave him $10 million. It's a one-year deal. Worst case, you can move him. It's not like this is a part right. that nobody wants. So, you know, it's not a, lo- a sunk cost or anything like that or some huge high-risk maneuver. We know the Pirates aren't going to make those. So, at the very least, you've got yourself an asset that other teams want. And if you're in a position where you are competing, you've got one that you're happy to have. Well, what a segue you just pulled off there, my friend, because the next thing I want to talk about is starting pitching. I think you could argue that the Pirates going into opening day last year were worse than they are going into opening day this year. I think that's how I feel. It might be a push. I would argue that they're better now than they were at the end of last year because it would be hard to be worse. Um, (laughs) This is not saying things are great. It's just saying you have three potential major league starters versus two. I really liked what they got from Johan Oviedo. I am intrigued by Marco Gonzalez and Martin Perez. I have no problem with either of those ads. I also think it's still incomplete. And I think when they take the field – Um, at Lone Depot Park in Miami for opening day, I think the Pirates are going to have a markedly better rotation than they did last year. Uh, But there's a little bit of TBD-ness to this, and I brought this up now, and the reason I said the segue is because, to me, it sort of links to Chapman. Not that he's going to, you know, you're you're not going to trade Colin Holderman or somebody for, or even David Bednar for a number two starter. But what you can do is if they trade a couple guys for a number two starter – and then trade Chapman in July. Again, I hope that they don't. I hope that they keep him and they win. That'd be a lot easier. But I'm just saying you have that fallback option where you know you can trade Chapman and probably replenish some of those prospects that you're giving up to get a number two starter. So long-winded explanation. I think they still need to get a legitimate number two starter. And if they do, I would say without a question, their starting rotation is better than it was at this point last year. What say you? Yeah, I think that's the X factor, right? I mean, I would say I would say across the board, the depth is probably better. And that's, some of that is just due in part to guys being closer to being major league ready, right? We're talking the guys who are coming yeah. up through the system. Now, on the flip side of that, one could have a very legitimate argument with me of saying, well, what did Quinn Priester, Luis Ortiz, and Roanzi Contreras show you last year that shows that the rotation or at least the pitching staff depth is in a better spot? Yep. It, would be, it would be a legitimate gripe, but I think the point is that those guys are all options in addition to players who are on the cusp, like a Jared Jones who is close. You've gotten guys through free agency. You've gotten guys that are knocking on the door or you've signed to incredibly low risk moves like a Peralta. So I view it more so as, okay, the real difference, the only reason that I say that this is potentially a wash is just because Johan Oviedo being out. If he's healthy, yeah. it's without a doubt a better spot to be in. Um, all that is to say that, yeah, I, I think – it's not Christmas time, it's February, but if you have something that's lingering on your list, you still need to get a number two. And I think that's just going to be, that's going to define whether this offseason is a total win or just trending kind of in a better direction. Because I think that's probably how Pirates fans feel. I don't mean to speak for them, but a lot of moves, it's like G-Man Choi, Rowdy Telez. There's a lot of similarity with those kinds of moves. It's, yeah. you know, there's some similarity, but if they're taking the next step uh, further, I think a number two starter would be it, right? For me, the guy is Edward Cabrera. I've I've mentioned that before. Um, you know, you look at and, and it checks all of the boxes that they're trying to check, right? Like mm-hmm. uh, using Bob Nutting's comments in, in the Dominican Republic about like we have to get better now and get better later. Cabrera makes them better now and better later. Um, you're going to have to give to get certainly, but if they're able to anchor a package around the, and 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 not get fleeced, and hopefully give up guys that aren't going to go to another organization and become you know, gold glovers or Cy Young award winners or whatever. Um, You know, I mean, that's to me, that's your winner. If you bring him back and you look at, and even if like, I'd I'd be thrilled if they they know a cinder guard they've been in on, I I believe that that's out there. No, uh, Domingo Herman's another name that a lot of sense from Trevor Bowers out there. Um, I don't know which route they would go with one of the, like, let's say they get one of those guys, couple them with Edward Cabrera. I don't think anybody would look at this Pirates offseason and call it a failure. I think that would intrigue a lot of people. 
And the Cabrera thing just intrigues me so much because of what I think he can do. Like he's been wild as all get out. If you look at his walk numbers so far, it's not good. Um, but at the same time, like if if his walk numbers were terrific, his ERA and strikeout and whatever, like the, the Marlins wouldn't give that up. The Marlins are basically willing to give him up by saying, like, man, I don't know if this guy can throw a strike. And the Pirates have to bring him in and say, no, we can we can teach him how to throw a strike. This is this is what we're going to fix. This is our plan for getting him around the plate. And dude, I mean, that's if that's doable, um, which I think it should be given their amount of prospects, where they're dealing from at second base, some of the younger pitchers they have, like they should be able to put a package together. And to me, that's just that 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 would seal it for me. Yeah, that's an intriguing one because I think there's a lot of factors at play there, even outside the Pirates, too, right? You look at the Marlins and go, this is a organization that has, um, you know, all sorts of pitching depth. And Edward Cabrera is probably something of a surplus. So I don't know that this is a guy that the Pirates have to give up the farm system for. They have yeah. a little bit of leverage there to say, well, if you don't give him up, where are you going to find starts for the rest of your guys who are coming up who are absolutely elite pitchers, right? I mean, that's a that's yep. an organ- a franchise that's pumping out pitchers. So, like, they can part with one. They're certainly looking for more bats, more position players. Like, there could be something there that I think could work out with the teams. It's an interesting proposition you bring up, and um, I kind of see eye to eye with you. He'd be a nice fit in Pittsburgh. All right, let's move on. Uh, got a couple other things I want to get to here, but let's go infield. Um, and I'm going to go – let's do the catching position separately. Okay. Let's let's do infield, then catcher, then outfield. Infield, I would say they're also better. Um, and my my reasoning is that Key Brian Hayes finished the season on his best two-month stretch of his career. Well, I guess – two combined months is September 20th, 2020 was ridiculous, but you know, the best sustained level of performance, really, really good. Right. You get O'Neill Cruz back. I think it, it, it they basically finished with Pagaro at second. I think they're going to start with Pagaro at second. Um, and I like Rowdy to Tele- I like the Telez and Joe platoon. I really do. And I mean, you got to remember they finished with what Joe and Rivas, um, which actually wasn't terrible if you look at the numbers, but I, I think the, Telez and Joe Platoon can be better. I guess you're comparing it in this comparison to Carlos Santana, which I don't love. There's going to be a sizable defensive drop off. Um, I think Santana brought a lot that they could really like, but overall, like if you give me Cruz back, that is that's starting you really high. Um, and I just I see the infield being better. What about you? Yeah, I see it being better too. And I think the Cruz part is the obvious factor, right? I mean, we we're still curious to see what he provides for you in terms of shortstop defense um this is a guy who got some time obviously playing in the dominican league over the winter which is huge for him and getting back in those reps but um outside of him i look across the board and another name i'll throw out there too jared triolo right this is a guy yeah good point right like i mean but he doesn't come to mind instantly for me either because it's like oh this is somebody who um you know was getting a lot of time at third when Brian hayes was hurt and then when he came back healthy then triolo was getting time at first and a little bit at second too like he could be a movable guy that can be a nice security blanket there uh, to kind of be a spot start at any of those spots. Um, so he's somebody you can move around. I just think it's deeper. Um, and I would also say with second base too, probably in a better spot, um, just given that, um, you know, it's no longer guys like Tucapita Marcano or Adolfo Castro in the fold there, or even getting that time at short like they did last year when Cruz was hurt. Um, those are guys that probably just didn't really have terribly high ceilings in Pittsburgh. So um yeah. I look at it as there's a lot more major league talent that's there. The only qualm that I would have um, is maybe just in terms of the talent that's coming up through the system. I don't see a lot of guys. Yeah, you're right. That are, that's a good point. Not a lot of guys that are close to major league ready. I mean, the other name I'll throw out there is Nick Gonzalez. He got a time. He got time in Pittsburgh, but you know they're still waiting to see what exactly they have with him beyond Gonzalez and Bay, um, and of course. Um, of course, Pagaro. Um, I, I just don't see anybody else really in the system. They might not need that much, though, Andrew. Seriously, no, like not. if yeah. if Cruz stays on the if, if it's Hayes and Cruz on the left side, I don't think anybody's going to take an issue take issue with that. Um, if Pagaro wins the second base job, cool. But you also have Tamar Johnson coming down the pike. Like, what happens with him? Yep. Um, where is Peggy? Go? I mean, they might they seriously might not have to solve that many problems. I true. I wonder about Triolo, and this is still something that there there's some. There's some log jam for me on the right side of the infield that I don't I, – I think this is also what I think feeds into a potential move where they want Triolo to play. I think Triolo should play. I think if he's the player that he was after he came back, you know, made his return, I should say, and made some swing changes, how he performed in September, really, really good. you got to find a place to play him, right? 
And I mean, you're looking at Joe, you're looking at Telez. I, I, don't, I don't see what they would do with Telez and why that would make sense. Um, at that point, probably Connor Joe and Jared, Jared Triolo become a little redundant. Um, I think of Joe as somebody that I could maybe package in a trade for a starting pitcher. Like if that, if, you know, if the package theoretically was like one of the second base candidates, a prospect, and then you had to have a third player or something to like make it work. To me, Joe, Joe profiles well there. I don't love it. I mean, you got to give to get, but I'd be okay losing it because I think it clears up some playing time for Triolo. As it stands, like it, it, you have Bay, Gonzalez, Triolo, and Pagaro, like basically all battling for one spot. And mm -hmm. you maybe stash one of them at AAA, that's fine. But like those guys need to play, they need to get reps. It's, it's not going to work sitting on the bench. So, Anyway, that, that's probably neither here nor there, but I, it's just something that is kind of like dangling out there that I don't don't totally understand. And, you know, we'll get to the outfield in a minute, but I also don't see a super clear path to playing time for Connor Joe in the outfield either because of Oliveras, because of I, I, maybe Palacios. I think he's going to be on the roster. What do you do with Kutch? We've got Reynolds, Sawinski. A lot of weird things. I, I just I, I don't see clarity there. I think there's probably clarity to be gained. Yeah, I think all of that is to say that you look at the infield depth and probably go, okay, they're in a better spot than last year. That doesn't mean that there's not still going to be difficult conversations and decisions to happen. Sure. So I think that's the takeaway that I have there. But yeah. shall, we get, shall we get into some catcher talk? Let's get into some catcher talk, and I would be hard-pressed for anybody to tell me why they're better behind the plate than they were last year. Not that they were great last year, but I think there's a drop. Uh, yeah, I got nothing. Um, I mean, no, 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 Andy. I mean, out for the year. That obviously is a huge impact in a negative way for them. Um, the only potential positive that I see that you can take away from this is that maybe you find out that Henry Davis can be an everyday catcher. That's the only positive takeaway. And I don't view yeah, that as a strength. That doesn't. I'm saying that point and clear that you know they are in a worse spot catching than they were last year. But yeah. the one positive is that if there was ever an opportunity for Henry to prove I can be an MLB catcher. Like this is the golden opportunity. Run with it. So yep. that's I mean, that's curious in my mind. That's I'm, you know, writing about here ahead of spring training is just, hey, like this is somebody to watch. What's he gonna do? Twenty twenty four is a huge season for Henry. So no doubt. Yeah. And I mean, I like Jason Delay a lot as a backup. I don't love Jason Delay. And I I hope he proves me wrong. You know, I hope he clips this piece of audio and plays it every day before he takes the field. And say, I'm gonna you know, stick it to that idiot. That's fine. Um, but I mean, like he was really good over two months, hit 319, 818 OPS. And then it just wasn't good. Hit 204, 560 OPS. I had to go back and look at like that. That's not going to work. Um, he framed the ball. Well, he did not throw well. His blocking was middle of the road. I, I really thought and was optimistic that Endy was going to be their guy was going to blossom into that. And, you know, knowing that I would have put Henry in right field as bad as it was. Um, I understand why they're sort of pivoting and saying, well, I mean, Henry was bad defensively in right field. What's the other alternative? He's bad defensively behind the plate. At least that's his somewhat natural position. He's motivated to go back there. Maybe it works out. Um, but it just really worries me, Andrew, as much heat as poor Austin Hedges took here some of it deserved some not um, at least there was going into the season with some level of certainty uh, defensively he was fine if not very good um, offensively he was obviously terrible they're going into this season expecting Jason delay to catch like 90 games 80 games Henry 90 games 80 games who knows what Ellie Sanchez he's played what six or seven MLB game and like that that's it yeah I mean that's a position that gets injured often. What if, you know, God forbid, what if one of those guys gets gets injured for the year? What happens then? Like, is your number one guy, your number two guy going to be Ali Sanchez? I, ho I hope not. I mean, that's not really adding much value. And you can talk about his defense all you want. Like, he's barely done it at the major league level. You're expecting a huge jump. And that's just – that part of it concerns me. I want to think positive thoughts like Henry's going to be – Great and work out and all will be well, but there's just there's a lot of ground between A and B. Yeah, a lot, a lot of a lot of ground to make up there. And I just yeah, the only positive you can take away is it's an opportunity. That doesn't mean that it's one that's going to be without its bumps and bruises and yeah. obstacles to overcome. That's just kind of the nature of it. Unless they make a move, and there's still some still some time. Yeah, um, but it, it, weird seeing like Tucker Barnhart sign other places, Jacob Stallings. Um, yeah, th like th those guys were to me would be perfect ads like the ceiling. Yeah. It's not great. Like 
whatever. I, we know what Jacob Stallings is, but we know that Jacob Stallings isn't going to completely embarrass himself. We know that if they have an injury, what uh, you know that, that that's okay. You know, you're at least in, and maybe they still will. Maybe they still will. Again, it's still February first. There's plenty of time. We'll see. All right, let's move to the outfield. Is the outfield better? I think this is probably a tie for me. I'm not sure if it's much better, much worse. Um, I like the Oliveras pickup. I really do. Um, you know, Reynolds and Sawinski or Constance, I think they're going to be be solid out there. A question, I worry whether Kutch is going to get out there enough to really be a main part of the outfield. I just, you know, the way he moved last year, the way he, like, to me, it's going to be like a green light to just take extra bases on him. I wonder if it's going to be deleterious to, it's an SAT word for you, um, to, to keeping him healthy for the whole year if he's out there and trying to do that. I just, it's probably about the same for me. What do you think? Yeah, probably about the same. Maybe a, a slight tick down. Um, I mean, I think you, you got to be excited about Oliveris bringing him in just because, you know, first year is a MLB regular. He proved something last year in Kansas City, but in the same token, it's like, okay, that's one season. That's one sample size. Um, I, I think something, the reason that I would say it's probably a wash is just given that, hey, it's year number two for Swinsky in center field. That yep. probably comes with more familiarity. Um, obviously, you know what you have in Reynolds. And Connor Joe can still continue to go out there. We'll see how often that happens. Palacios proved to be a nice fourth or fifth outfielder. It's probably the same spot. That's probably fair. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any need in overthinking this or overanalyzing it. They added the piece. Kutch is probably not going to factor in too much. If he does, that's a benefit. Yeah. Probably fair look at it. Yeah. All right. So, again, I mean, that leads me to believe that I do think they're going to be better than 76 wins. Um, I would hope the remaining parts of their off season give them enough to clear 500. Um, and I think, remember, this is a team that finished 35 and 32 with a lot of the same pieces we're talking about. Um, probably not the tone of the fan base right now, and that's okay. I think that will change as spring starts up and they start to see some things. But, you know, I, I think this team can actually be pretty decent. I really do. Um, so, all right, let's move on. I have a couple more things I wanted to get to and get your take on. Andrew, um, as I was driving back from Cooperstown, um, you might have been flying. I think you were flying to Toronto at this point. Willie Peralta, Pirates signed him to a minor league deal, and it was the rare acquisition for the Pirates that went over well with the fan base. Can you believe that? They liked it. What did you think? Um, I think it's a move that it's low risk, right? I mean, it's as low risk as they possibly come. This is a guy who at one juncture in his career was a legitimate MLB pitcher, a legitimate starter. Um, obviously last season didn't quite go according to plan for him, uh, in triple a had some struggles there, but I view it as, Hey, I mean, what is the absolute worst case scenario here? Sure. It, sure. it doesn't, it doesn't work out and you just toss the guy aside. Like Do you that, think he ends up hitting major league innings for the pirates this year. It's an interesting question. I will answer it by saying yes, but it will not exceed more, let's say than 30 innings. I think okay. it's a couple. I think it's a couple of spot starts. It's probably you know what spot starts. Interesting. Probably similar to like is Waldo Bito. Okay. I could see it being a similar type of role. How about you? Yeah, I think he gets up here. I do. I think it makes a lot of sense. I like the move, low risk, all that stuff. But I think he, I think they have a use for him, and I think, I think he fits their type where they're taking damaged goods. They're taking guys that they think they can scheme into having success, and. I think if you look at their team right now, that's sort of what they're trending toward, where you've got like a core three of Mitch, Marco Gonzalez, Martin Perez. And then as of now, unless they add somebody else, they've got Rowanzi, Priester, Ortiz, um, some guys on the way with like, you know, Jackson Wolf has made one start. He'll make more Jared Jones, um, Skeens that we're going to get to in a bit. Um, I wouldn't necessarily put Paul in this category, but. Uh, Bailey Falter is another one where you're basically going to look for a pocket of the game where they're effective. Maybe two innings, three innings, one time through the order, whatever. Um, you know, and it's not your, it, it, it's probably not everybody's favorite. It's not the sexiest way to deploy pitchers. But yeah, can you find a team, a pocket of hitters, uh, matchups to work one out of every five days a week? Yeah, you can. And I think that's my, that, that's probably what they're going for here. And, you know, I can see Peralta working into that. Um, Similar to Cabrera, they need to get him to throw more strikes. I'm not smart enough to, you know, go correct the guy's mechanics, but his walk numbers are high. Um, they can't be high. The Pirates can't afford to get free passes. So you're seeing if you can correct something. Who knows? 
Yeah. In the worst case, yeah, it doesn't work out, but you've got a part there, and we've seen this before with the Pirates, right, where they bring in these kinds of guys, and it does work out often more times than not. Now, it yeah. might not be in some supremely effective manner where some guy's an ace or anything like that, but that's not what they're asking for here. They're looking yeah. for a guy who can maybe cover some MLB innings, right? So For sure. For sure. All right, last topic I wanted to kick around with you, Andrew. MLB put out something, um, and I thought it was an interesting thing. They basically did for every team, there's one number that's going to matter or something like that. And what they picked for the Pirates was Paul Skeens, and he'd be up there. We'll disagree. I mean, I think that matters a ton. I think it matters on a fan perception thing. Fans want to see him up here. Uh, I understand the Pirates' strategy going into this. Like, I do think they're going to try to preserve a year of club control in the contract. I've been saying that. I think it's going to get real funky is if they allow him to pitch or, or require him to pitch in Altoona and Indy if he just shoves. You know, if he has like five, six dominant starts, um, it happens. I, I, I don't think they can wait much longer. I think they know they can't wait much longer, especially if they need rotation help. Like, you can't hold that guy down there and say, hey, you know, like his fifth pitch just is not coming along <laughs> the way we need it. You know, and they're like running right. Bailey Falter out there and – and Willie Peralta and God knows who else. Like, I, I don't see that. So, uh, to me, I, we're going to get into uh, briefly, like, some other numbers, dates, and, and that sort of stuff that matters to you. But, you know, what do you, how do you think the skeins things, skeins thing goes along, how they play it? Um, how excited are you to see him? Yeah. I mean, I, first and foremost, supremely excited. Haven't seen the guy pitch live. I mean, that's somebody who an electric arm is the only way I can think to describe him and a polished one at that, too. But, um, in terms of when I expect to see him or when he should be expected to see and be seen in Pittsburgh, it's like, I don't know, man. It's it's a ticking time bomb. It's how can we get him up here as soon as possible? How can we appease the fan base and make sure that they're, you know, being treated correctly in that manner of, hey, this is somebody that we think highly of. This is somebody that uh, deserves to be here. So when it comes to Paul, I mean, hey, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him as early as a beginning of June, as beginning as early as a you know mid May, something like that. I'm not ruling that out by any stretch. Um, in terms of my personal expectations, I think June is probably the earliest. Um, but hey, I mean, I, I would say that anything is on the table with Paul. We've seen that be the case with other hot can't miss prospects in the past, where they can only keep him down for so long. The one that immediately comes to mind is Chris Bryant. You know how he was managed with the Cubs. Obviously, very different circumstance hitter versus pitcher, but like. There was only so long they could keep him down. So with Paul being a non-roster invitee to spring training, it's like he's going to get a chance to throw here. He's going to get a chance to show what he can do against some top competition, um, or at the very least in the spring training setting. Like If he impresses there, man, it's going to be really hard to keep him away. I'm glad they're bringing him into Major League Camp. I didn't doubt that they would, certainly. Sure. Um, I wish – I mean, maybe they are. Maybe I'm just misreading perception. I don't know, but – I really hope that when we get down to Florida and if Skeens is just like otherworldly good and they need to fill a rotation spot, why the heck not? Why? Because we're going to worry about six years from now, seven years from now. Like I understand if that's like your tiebreaker, right? Like if I can address my rotation better that I don't have to go that route, you know, if I can go like we're talking about trade for Edward Cabrera, maybe sign somebody else. Maybe Rowanzi's really good. I want to give Rowanzi an opportunity and I don't have to force schemes in there. I can say, you know what, go to the minors. Not a big deal. I'm not talking about that. Like that, that would be great. Um, but if you, if, if the alternative is we're going to take three pitchers in a bag full of nothing to Miami, um, why not schemes? I hope they're not overly adherent to baseball rules. Um, I know anybody who watches this is going to come back at me with, you know, the pirates and how they manipulate service time or how they think they believe manipulate service time or all this stuff. I mean, there's no financial savings for the pirates. They're preserving a year of control by not allowing him to reach a full year of service. I just hope they're open to if Paul really opens some eyes. Cause I think, I mean, I believe in this kid a lot. <laughs> it's not a, not a, a big, you know, long leap here. Um, I think he's going to be absolutely electric. I can't wait to watch him in spring, man. You have have you seen him live? Did you get over to Altoona for any of his starts? Yeah, I caught him. I can't one, remember. Yeah, I caught him the one start in Altoona, and it was you know consistently pumping a hundred, right? Easy, effortless. Um, the slider oh, is awesome. I mean, it's, yeah, I view it as this: if he pushes the envelope, how can you not send it? That's my cliche for the day. I mean, <laughs> I I just view it seriously though. It's like I mean, this guy is as close to a major league ready pitcher coming out of college as we've probably ever seen. And I don't yep. think that's a stretch to say. Yeah. 
Why All right, cl- closing thing. What's your what's another number that Pirates fans should be uh, be concerned about? Like, if you were writing that article, what would be the number that you're that worried about with the Pirates this season? In terms of like a date for a guy to come up, or no, any any number, any number you want. Ooh, um, it could be a date when a guy comes up. I don't know. Yeah, why. I'll say any I'll number. just say I'll say five. I'll say the number five <laughs> for say, no reason, just the number five. Because five rotational guys. Do you have that? Do you have that for the entire season? Do you have got five guys who can stick, or or I'll even throw another number out there. I'll say twenty. Do you have five guys who can make twenty starts every you know this entire season? Yeah. I'm not so confident about that. Um, and I think that's really, you know, if you're holding gum to my head, I'm saying that's what's going to determine the uh, Pirates' fate this season. Is do they have five consistent starters or five guys who are frequently in the rotation? I think that's I it. Hear. I hear that. Um, far be it for me to disagree with you. The number I'm looking at, though, is probably I, and, and I'm going to pick something here. Um, let's say 750, something like that runs okay. to me. Like, how many runs is it going to take to get you into the playoffs? And like 752 runs that takes me to the Padres. They were 13th in MLB last year, so I'm mean, maybe higher than seven. Maybe maybe we'll say 760. 760 runs would have put them 12th in MLB. Um, I want to see what this offense can do. I think this offense needs to be more dynamic than it was. I think that's one of the dials the Pirates have that can be turned the most. Um, I know I use that terminology quite a bit, but I mean, you figure what they were last year and they did make improvements. Like this is not a defense of where they were, but like if you look numerically at where they were in 2022 versus 2023, they did take steps forward. Now they did that without O'Neill Cruz. They did that probably without, you know, Carlos Santana was good. He wasn't great. They were hoping that adding Rowdy to doing things a little bit differently at first. Um, they can get more out of Andrew McCutcheon. Henry Davis takes another step. Uh, O'Neill Cruz at shortstop being back. Like there's a lot of places where I think the pirates can, if they're going to surprise some people to me, I mean, yes, the pitching thing matters, but to be a little bit differently, to be a little bit different, they've got to score. They've got to score. They've got to put the ball over the fence. They've got to run. They've got to be the offense that they were last year during that 20 and eight start, or at least like 75% of it. Um, when we saw the Pirates bottom out last year, it was because their offense bottomed out. You know, they, they sort of lost their approach. They got over aggressive. They started pressing. Their offense did not give them enough cushion. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking about, you know, some of the changes they've made and what they can be as a group. If, like, you know, again, Triolo turns out to be real. Henry Davis grows into something. Figaro, et cetera, can be really exciting. Yeah. it's. I mean, hey, it's across the board. I think that's the conclusion is that everything is getting close, but it's not quite there. And I think that can apply both offense, defense, pitching, or, uh, you know, pitching as well. It's across the board. There's got to be a little bit of improvement. And that's a good one to touch on because you're putting on the money ball cap there with the runs. I think that's a good one to turn yeah. to. All right. That does it for us this week. Andrew has plenty of NHL all-star game stuff to – Go do and see and cover in Toronto. Um, I'm going to go do some more work here in the office and and long for spring training. Uh, but anyway, thank you for watching this episode of Pitching In. Make sure you like and subscribe that you can all check out all of our Post-Gazette content. Uh, for Andrew Destin, I am Jason Mackey, and we will talk to you again right here next week. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. All right. Thank you, sir. Anytime, man. Glad we got to do it. All right, good stuff. We'll be in touch. Yep, see ya.